market cycle that we're going through. Uh, this is a cycle that can uh, be taken for almost any market. Uh, the stock market, gold, whatever you like. But the, uh, the emotion that you feel as you go th through these cycles tends to push you in exactly the wrong direction. And uh, as the market hit the bottom and everyone is completely depressed by how much money they've lost and they're in despair, that's when Warren Buffett starts loading up and blood is in the street. And that's what you should do too. It's really hard when you feel terrible to think that's what I should be buying. And when euphoria sets in because you've made so much money, that's when you should be in panic mode. So if you're feeling euphoria right now, start worrying about it. So we're going to try and work out where we are on this curve. If you're still in despair and skepticism, I would say you're out of phase. You're probably not as far as euphoria, but you might be feeling uh, enthusiasm. Somewhere between hope and enthusiasm is where you should be right now, and I'm trying to help you home in on where that is for your particular part of the market. Actually, it's all really very simple. Like most markets, what drives it is the balance between supply and demand. Right now, supply is low. Demand is not high. It's normal. Nothing really special about demand. But supply is very low. When that happens, prices start to go up. Not immediately. There's, there can be up to a year's delay between these things happening. We've had low supply for a very long time. And at first, everyone was saying to me, why aren't prices going up? Supply is terrible. So just wait, just wait. Eventually, it will. So you've got to try and measure these things. Measuring supplies is uh, depend on being able to have good access to what's available on the market. It's not all on the MLS. You know, some of it goes through trustee sales. But it's not, it's not really rocket science. And before I go into the detail, I'm going to give you a chart which really summarizes the situation. So if you want to have a nap, once you finish this chart, you can ignore the other charts. <laughs> we have what I call a chronic shortage of home. Chronic in the sense that it's here for a good long time. It's not going to be solved this year. It's most severe at the bottom of the market. And it's not a problem over two billion. If you're looking for homes at that level, there's still plenty of choice and not that many other people putting in competitive offers. So, good luck. In between, in between, there's a kind of shading as it gets more and more um, relaxed as you go up in price. But of course, things, markets are, uh, the, the market is going up in price, so these homes are actually moving from one range to the next. What used to be below 200,000 is now 250. Loan delinquency has been a huge issue for uh, the state and Phoenix in particular. It's almost back to normal. I'm going to look in a little bit of detail on that. Foreclosures are still slightly elevated, but they're almost back to normal. We'll probably be back to normal before the end of this year, and we'll probably go below normal next year. Investors have been active for a long time. They really moved in in force in 2009. The media picked up on it last year, about three years late, just as it was peaking and starting to go down. They're losing interest for pretty obvious reasons, because the prices have gone up. And if prices are high, as an investor, you can't get the cash on cash return when you rent the home out. So there are still plenty of investors about, but quite a few of them have lost sticks and said, oh, I'm off to somewhere else where the prices are still much lower. Atlanta has been a very popular place for them for the last 12 months, but their prices have been going up too, so they're going to lose interest in that and find somewhere else. New homes is actually something that I ignored for about four years because there was hardly anything going on. But now that it's starting to perk up, it's probably the most important thing to watch. New homes are really important to the market because that is where new supply comes from. And um, whether they're going to build as many homes as we need or not is the key issue. At the moment, they're supply constrained, they can't get enough land, and in particular, they can't get enough labour. We lost the largest part of our skill construction workers in 2008 to 2009. Many of them went into other trades, left the state, or whatever. So if you want to build a house, your biggest problem is can you get anybody to do it? There's also a problem with the uh, materials, because some of those have gone up dramatically in price. So 
All of these things tend to mean the price of new homes is going up. I'm going to focus today specifically on Scottsdale and on the luxury market. My message to you there is the luxury market is improving, I'm sure you've seen that, but it's improving more so at the bottom end and it's going to gradually go up like a tide, lifting all the boats. And we'll look at some specific examples. So first of all, let's look at long delinquency rates. I say they're almost back to normal. This compares Arizona in blue with the country as a whole. Back in 2010, early part, we were at 16.3% of all first home loans were at least 30 days late. You can't be 29 days late because your payment isn't even due yet, right? So this is, a, you know, including everybody who's even slightly uh, a problem. That's a pretty bad number and we're in fact fifth worst at that stage. So it's not surprising that we have a lot of uh, foreclosures, a lot of real uh, disturbance in the market at that point. But in the following years, we've gone down faster than any other state. We're now at 6.7%, which is only slightly above 5%, which is the norm. It's always going to be about 5%. And went from fifth worst to 43rd. Not many people talk about this, but that's, that's a very long way down the chart. And you see the rest of the country has improved, but nothing like as much. We're actually the most improved state, and the second most improved state is California, which is also quite good to us, because that's where a lot of our buyers come from. It's not good everywhere. Here are some few other states that are interesting. Florida has been the worst state for delinquency throughout this period, and still is, although it's starting to see some improvement now. The slope is at least downwards. New Jersey wasn't so bad. There was an 11 and a bit, but it's got worse and worse ever since. This is why, for the last three years, I've told people who are working in REOs, I say, if you like REOs, they're going away. So, you know, move to New Jersey. Uh, that's what they're going to be there for a decade, right? <laughs> because they've got more people to live with now than they've ever had. It's not getting any better. Plus, population is declining in New Jersey. Now, our population has never declined. Even in 2010, we had a small increase. But our population is now growing quite fast. And of course, what's the biggest driver of housing? People. Having more people. I mentioned that New York is just a little way behind New Jersey. Still, things are pretty bad in New York, and they're pretty bad in Connecticut. Why do I pick these two up? Because that's where just about all the housing analysts live. <laughs> so when you read Robert Schiller going on about how he's really depressed about the housing market, it's because he lives in Connecticut. <laughs> and, you know, all housing is local, but you see the world from where you sit. Right? I, I live in Arizona, I feel quite good about the housing market and I, because I don't really pretend to follow any other market other than Arizona. If I was following Connecticut, I'd probably feel much more pessimistic about it because they've still got a lot of delinquent loans to get through. And of course out there, all of these states have judicial foreclosure, which takes years. Now when we started our foreclosure cycle, Everyone was grumbling that foreclosures came so quickly. And it's true, it was a disaster because the banks just foreclosed on thousands and thousands of people immediately. That was kind of good for the market long term, however, because we got rid of those delinquent loans and we, they were out of the way. The houses are now in the hands of people who can't afford to pay them or bought them with cash. So it's really like when you get gangrene, sometimes it's best to just chop the leg off rather than just hold it and get better. And that's what Arizona did. And quite a few other western states are in the same sort of account. So here's a map of the country. If they're blue, then they're below average in terms of delinquency. If they're red, they're worse than average. So you see, Nevada sticks out like a sore thumb. The rest of the western part of the country is actually in great shape. We have a lower delinquency rate than all of our neighbors except for Colorado. And the lowest of all is up in these uh, North Dakota and these states are actually having a booming economy and a big housing shortage because of the oil and gas industry. So the biggest problems are down here in the south. And 
across here, particularly in the uh, New York, New Jersey, and parts of New England. So don't expect too wonderful uh, results in the long term from that part of the country. So foreclosures, I don't get anything like as many questions about foreclosures now compared to a year ago. And there's a reason for that. This is what the foreclosure pending chart looks like. For a long time, this goes back to 96, we were just, foreclosures were growing in line with population, and then they started dipping down. That was at the peak of the bubble. And of course, then we saw this enormous wave, which peaked in 2009. And although I pointed out at the time, it's coming down, everybody was still really negative and going on and on about how there's going to be another wave. Do you see another wave? No. I said at the time, no, this is supposed to be a wave. <laughs> about here, everybody was talking about, oh yeah, when, the, when the, um, the lenders come to this agreement with the states, there's going to be yet another flood of foreclosures because they're going to release them. And I said, no, not a flood, but there might be a little ripple, which was that. So when we're about to hear, what does that mean? Well, it means we're pretty much back to the long-term trend line. There's always going to be some foreclosures. Population keeps growing, there will be more foreclosures because there are more people. But we don't have anything abnormal, really. We're currently about uh, maybe at the most 20% above normal, and that will disappear over the next few months. Now, last year, 12 months ago, everybody was talking about shadow inventory and how that was the next thing we had to worry about. The market wasn't going to improve because the banks were going to dump all these homes. So I've got a little quiz for you, for those people who've fallen asleep already. <laughs> so I've counted them, or rather the assessor's counted them, because he likes to charge taxes on them. There's 123,178 homes in the city of Scottsdale, not counting multifamily. Scottsdale is a little unusual in that actually has far more condos and townhomes than what the average for Phoenix. But my question to you is, of that number, how many do you think are owned by banks? 1,500. 1,500? 150. 150. 1,000. Sorry? 4,000. 3,000? 400. 400. 100. I've heard that trouble. A couple of thousand, okay. When I started asking a similar question about five months ago, I had numbers like 20,000 or 30,000 coming back. Correct answer is 214. And you say, how do I know? Well, I've got a spreadsheet. <laughs> you can download it yourself from a conference or count it yourself if you like. It's got all of the bank owned properties, it's updated every day. As the banks sell them, they come off, and as new foreclosures get completed, they go back on. But 120 is a very good answer because if I take, look at the MLS, there's 112 of them that are on the MLS already. So 50 are already sold and in escrow, so they don't, they're not going to belong to the bank much longer. 52 are still for sale, and there's 112 that the banks own that aren't listed. This is the shadow inventory, the scary <laughs> inventory that the bank is going to dump on. So should they did dump all 112, that would increase our active listings by 4%. Which, I mean, I don't know if you've noticed, but active listings go up by 4% in a week anyway. For, and then they go down again the next week. So you wouldn't even notice if the entire shadow of the Scott's tail was dumped. So it just amazes me that people go on and on about this, at least in Arizona. Now, in some states, it's valid to worry about <laughs> because all real estate is low. Housing supply is the most important issue we have. It's very low at the low end of the market. It's particularly difficult if you're a new first time home buyer, A, to find anything that you like, and B, to beat off the 30 other people who also like it. In the middle of the market, I would say it's pretty tight, it's very competitive. By the middle, I mean like 200 to 500,000. It's very likely there's gonna be a couple of other people after the same house too, and you probably have to put up with things you wouldn't normally accept. And then it's plentiful at the high end. It's not piled up high. And in fact, the sales rate in the luxury market is improving. So that the, even though the inventory is there, 
it's been turned over more quickly than it has been for quite some time. But it varies a lot by price. So the first thing I want to do is let's look at what the supply is and where it sits by price. Here are all the homes on MLS that are listed for more than a million. And lo and behold, surprise to everybody here, they're mostly in Scottsdale <laughs> or Paradise Valley. Now, admittedly, there's a few in Owatuki, there's some over here in uh, Las Cendas, some at Gold Canyon, but the vast majority of million dollar homes are in the Northeast Valley. So that's where prices have gone up the least. They might be the most desirable homes but they don't have a supply problem. So prices are only edging up there, they're not shooting up. But, distressed homes are disappearing from the market fastest there too. So you don't get the prices pulled down by the occasional REO or short sale, they're really disappearing quite fast. So the averages are looking like they're improving quite a bit in these areas. The opposite end of the market, is below 100,000. There's actually still quite a lot of these places where you can buy homes for less than 100,000. These are the places where you can buy them for 20,000 just a few years ago. Yeah. So you can buy homes for 100,000. I'm not kidding. So West Phoenix, South Glendale, Avondale, South Phoenix, uh, El Mirage, Youngtown, parts of Apache Junction, parts of Mesa, but this is dramatically fewer dots than you would have seen three or four years ago. Once you get past 500 dots, it always looks like a lot. But I want you to concentrate on where they are geographically, because there's none at all in Scottsdale. <laughs> but where a house has gone up the most in the last year, number one city, El Mirage. Number Number three is Phoenix, dominated by west and the south of Phoenix. Huge plus, 30% plus increases in, in prices there. Apache Junction is high up in the list. All of these places follow the same time, where they're cheapest, the prices have gone up the most. So let's look at the, the charts on active listings. This is the numbers, I take them off the MLS every day. This chart has a dot for every day since the beginning of 2011. And you can see that we did have over 40,000 listings then. And here I'm including those that are UCP, used to be called AWC. Same thing really, just to change of name. We have about the same number of normal listings now as we had then. But what we don't have is all of these short sales and bank hold homes and hub homes. You can see that it's gone down from 40 to 20,000, but if I take out the UCBs, this is what it looks like. The vast majority of today's listings are not distressed in any way, whereas half of them used to be, as recently as the beginning of 2011. This, however, is an inadequate supply. I would claim that for a balanced market in Phoenix, we should have about 30 to 35,000 homes listed. So 15,000 is about half what we need. It's not as bad as it was this time last year. So if you were trying to buy a home last year, it was even worse than it is now. Now that's for, that's for every part of the market. If you're looking for homes under 150,000, it's far more difficult. We've come from 20,000 down to only 4,000. Again, it's not quite as bad as it was last year, but it's pretty terrible. And two, back in 2011, about uh, three quarters of the homes were distressed at that point. Now about 80% of them are not distressed. There's still a bit more distressed at the bottom end than there is the higher up there. Believe it or not, you can still buy homes in Scottsdale under 150,000. They're mostly condos, and they're mostly in 85257, and not very large. But you can see, you can still get about 110 of them, but we used to have 600, so their supply is way down. 
This is the whole of Scott's step. Again, each time you do this, you get a different picture. And by the way, on the comfort report, these are customizable charts you can build yourself by checking the boxes. Scottsdale as a whole has a much healthier supply than the Abalic, and is actually on a slight upward trend at the moment. But it's still well down from the 4,000 we used to have. We're about 2,400, 2,300 here. But notice how healthy it is. Very small number of REOs or short sales. And it's not absolutely sure which direction we're going in that. In the last month, it's actually dipped a little bit, but that may be just a short-term effect. Over 500,000, the shortage is less intense. We've got pretty much a similar amount of homes available now as we had uh, two years ago, a bit less, but more than we had at the end of the spring last year. But again, the, the, the distressed problems are starting to become almost insignificant at this price point. Over 2 million, as I say, we've got plentiful. We have, we have less than we had then, but almost as many. And lo and behold, not a single bank on home. There's one short set. So out of the 250 or so listings, only one distressed. This market is back in normal shape. So even if there should be no reason why these prices are going up, people are expecting them to go up anyway because they hear that the market's going up so that the sellers think they should be getting more for their property. So, you know, if the sellers have got more background loan, that tends to improve the pricing. So overall, simplest way of looking at it, the pricing is up almost everywhere, particularly at the low end, but there are the odd exception. I dare say in this room there's not a single person who worries about these exceptions. <laughs> Anyone dealing with the event? No? Well, I'm still seeing negative year-on-year -year numbers, but only like minus 1% for some of these outlier areas that are mainly rural. And if you look at Arizona as a whole, there's been a massive movement of population into the cities and away from the outer rural areas. It's been going on for a century. And it continues today. This is what pricing has done, and uh, this is the long-term view from 2011, uh, 20, 2001 to right now. We're at 117, which actually isn't very much of an advance over the 99 we had 13 years ago. But we had a pretty exciting ride in between. <laughs> we went up hard. We fought to stay up there for a while and then we collapsed in 2008. But anyone who bought in this period is probably feeling pretty good about their investment right now. This is a very steep increase, which is causing some people to be concerned that it's out of control. No, it's perfectly natural that prices would recover at that kind of rate because we had such an unnatural drop. We're still below the long-term trend. If 99 was a fair price for your house, then it should be about 135 now. So 117 is still above the price. When it goes to 140, which it probably will at some point, then I'll say, okay, maybe it's a little, little frosty now. But those people who are going into the media and saying, it's looking bubbly in Phoenix, just don't know what they're talking about. This is Scott's step. Now the trouble is when you do Scottsdale, it gets much more um, migraine inducing because you've got a lower um, transaction rate, so you get much more variability if you just measure each month. One way of solving that is you measure over a long period. So here I'm measuring six months at a time, and you still see a nice shape. What you do see is that prices dropped most of the way down in 2008 and 9, but they continue to go down a little bit, much more than the rest of Phoenix. Phoenix itself was actually starting to go up during that period because that's where the investors were piling in and snapping up properties, particularly in the West and South. But we hit bottom in Scottsdale uh, around uh, August, September, so the six month average starts popping up at that point. And that's a pretty healthy upward slope we've got there at the bottom. This is for Scottsdale, but now I'm looking at only 500,000 and above. 
Still um, a healthy upward trend right now, but you will see a lot of people jagged uh, chart here because the, the Scottsdale luxury market is very seasonal. Uh, prices tend to go up in the first six months of the year, and then they tend to go down in the second six months of the year. And it does that pretty much every year. So if you're doing a six month average, you'll see this sawtooth pattern. Homing in on just the last uh, couple of years, I'm looking at a 12-month moving average. Here I'm looking at the lower part of the luxury market, 500,000 to a million. Pretty healthy growth there, but it's not dramatic. $182 a square foot to just under 200. Nothing like the percentage increase that's at the low end of the market, but I think we'd all feel that that's pretty healthy. It's not crazy, but it's very healthy. Moving up to the million to two million mark, we've also got a nice healthy up looking chart, gone from 234 at the bottom to 269, and still trending upwards. Two million to three million, 329 has now gone up to 366, it seems to be hesitating around that mark at the moment. But you've got to remember, we have very few examples to choose from here. Yeah. Homes between two and three million, not an awful lot of them sell every month. But this is a 12 month average, and so you can rely on the direction that it's set as being pretty convincing. Over three million, wow, it looks different from every other chart. We had a really bad <laughs> first quarter last year. But we bounced straight back, and the beginning of this year has looked pretty healthy. We're now at 463, which is better than we've seen since the beginning of 2011. So even that market is showing some signs of strength from a price perspective. So a good question is what's going to happen next? Now, it's possible for me to tell you what's going to happen in a month or two. It's not possible for me to tell you what's going to happen next year. That's just guesswork. But the way I can tell you what's going to happen next month is to look at what's in escrow. Because I've got access to the MLS and they charge me a huge amount of money for that, I can add up the price per square foot of everything that's yet to and divide it up into different parts of the market. This is the overall picture for Greater Phoenix. So when I say Greater Phoenix, it just means I've taken out the things for Flagstaff and Payson and all those out of area listings. And you can see we've from uh, the summer of 2011, we've had a big push forward up until the summer of last year when we went sideways and slightly down. We then had a big advance during the uh, fall of last year, a slight hesitation there over the holiday period, which is also a common seasonal effect, and then just rocketing upwards right now. Now, there's no sign of hesitation there, but remember, we're now at the point that we were here. So it would not surprise me if we suddenly start going sideways over the next month or two, because we're starting to hit the period that we saw that happen last year. That doesn't change my opinion that prices are going to go up, it just means we have the summer hesitation starts about now. You can do the same chart for Scottsdale, and it looks like that. Still far higher point than we've been for a long time, and this is a big jump from down here, 155 up to 215. This is all price ranges. So right now, the outlook is still looking like prices are on an upward trend, and until supply starts increasing, there's no likelihood of it changing. Now the people that have been talking a lot about investors and all that sort of stuff, and how they're going to dump all their investment homes on the market, so I want to address that question. It's certainly true that we've had a lot of purchases of cash rather than finance. You can see we used to have only about 8 to 10 homes purchased for cash, and in the last few years, 35% has been typical. But the trend is starting to drop a little bit. It's early yet, but I, being obsessive, I look at these things, and soon the trend starts forming, I report on it. So I see this dropping down. We're starting to see jumbo loans become a little easier to get, so the cash purchases at the high end of the market 
are becoming a little lower and the finances are going up. And if you look at what people fill in on their affidavit, the number of people who are planning to rent the homes out has been high for a very long time, but is now on a definite downward trend in both Maricopa and for now. This is why I say that the investors are starting to lose interest and pull out. They're still active at the moment, but they're gradually slowing down and looking out. The thing is that most of the investment properties are being rented out now. They're not being bought as an investment to flip. And the idea that maybe 100,000 rented homes could suddenly be dumped onto the market and kill the market is kind of crazy when you think about it, because those 100,000 homes have people living in. So if those investors were to send all those 100,000 families out and sell their homes off, where are those 100,000 families going to live? They're going to need a house. So it's actually neutral in terms of supply and demand. When an investor sells an occupied house, the only time it actually makes the market go worse is if they sell a house that's empty. Because that's an extra supply and no demand. So what you want to watch for, if you want to know where the market's going, is the vacancy rate. If lots of these rentals start to be empty, that's a sign that the investors are going to start saying, well, I don't want an empty house, I might as well cash out now. And they will gradually feed those homes back into the supply. It won't come 100,000 homes. They'll just come in droops and drabs. And it'll improve the balance so that we get back to a normal market. It's all very healthy, really. Now, I wanted to spend a little bit of time on new homes because, as I said, this is really important. It's still a very, very small part of the market. They were, at one point, less than 5%. The banks were selling 10 homes for every bank of home sellers were selling. Home builders were selling. That's now different. The, new, the home builders are selling more homes than the banks are. They're up to 11% of the market, which is almost double what it was last year. But it's still way down from what we would consider normal. It would be normal for new homes to be 25% of all the transactions. Here are the monthly sales counts. When you talk to a builder, when they, talk to, when they tell you about a sale, they mean they've got a contract signed. That's not what I count. I count when it's closed escrow, because they can fall out. When escrow is closed, it's a real sale, so this is what I'm counting. We were desperately low at the beginning of uh, 2011, 333, same month this year, 799. Well, up for twice as much. So you can see a definitely strong upward trend here in new home sales. But when you put it in the context of history, that's what we just looked at. Even the best line there is pathetically small. But what we were doing in 1999, which definitely wasn't a particularly boom year, that was just a regular kind of old year. More than 2,500 new homes sold every month. You can also see that we were kind of building a bit too much at this point, but we built far too few for a very long time because the what was the point of building a home if you were trying to compete against a bank home property? You couldn't make any money, so they just stuck. But it means we now have a shortage of homes because the population has continued to grow. Here's another way of looking at it, permits. That's also something that the census uh, records. So everybody can look at this stuff and look at permits by city. Even now, the builders are actually increasing their permit counts, but nowhere near what they were like, even as long ago as 1996. This is the 12-month average of the same chart, because you've got a lot of spiking. So this gives you a more balanced view of what, what the trend has been. Clearly overbuilding here, underbuilding here, just starting on the road to recovery. But we're looking at maybe 12,000 permits for the whole year. And yet, we're probably going to get maybe 60,000 population increase. Normally, there's a new home built for every two and a half people who move here. We're only building one for every six people who move here. So it's going to get more cramped. 
Now, literally, those people could move, don't have to buy a new home, they could move into a rental, but they're not exactly widely available at the moment. So why people are building multifamily homes too. There just isn't enough accommodation for the number of people who are moving to Arizona, particularly to Phoenix. Now, Scottsdale looks quite different, actually, from the... The amazing thing is that Scottsdale has pretty low permit uh, counts, and that started back in 2001. It's like Scottsdale said, OK, we're going to go for quality, not for quantity. So the number of new homes built in Scottsdale has been low for a very long time, but it's almost minuscule fit, like three in a month. And even now, we're up to uh, relatively small numbers. Most of the building is going on in particular places like Gilbert, Peoria, uh, Queen Creek, Santan Valley. That's where the Belkai, places where land is available at a price they can afford and they can make a profit. Land is not affordable in Scottsdale for anything unless you're going to build a million dollar home. So you should not expect to see large numbers of homes, new homes built in Scottsdale until the luxury market actually ends up at a shortage. Because the shortage, these people who are moving to Arizona, they're not moving here really to buy million dollar homes. Most of them are moving here to do relatively uh, low or middle income jobs. So they're looking for homes in the sort of 200,000 range. Now this chart needs a bit of explanation, but I think it's probably the most important one I've got right now. It's trying to tell you what's going to happen to uh, the market over the next few years. And it does that by comparing population growth. Here, this is the number of people added to the population of uh, Maricopa County. On this scale here, we have new home closings in thousands. So that's the blue line. And you can see there's a very strong correlation, historically. When the blue line is below the red line, prices tend to go up. When the blue line gets above the red line, we're overbuilding, and that's going to end in tears. So you can see the builders couldn't stop building homes fast enough here. <laughs> the population growth collapsed because the economy collapsed, and because we passed lots of laws trying to get rid of people. If you're in housing, getting rid of people is not good for the market, no matter what your politics are. The population drops, people need fewer houses. The key thing is, the population has now started to grow again. So we have line cost here, and we're now not catching up. This is the Arizona State Department of Administration's low growth scenario for population. We are below the line by a larger amount than we've seen for a very long time, even with that low growth scenario. And of course, they have other scenarios. That's the medium growth. That's the high growth scenario. And if you would talk to the builders as I do, I have no idea how they could possibly get back to that line with their current plans. If you don't like the, what the state numbers, you could use those produced by my friend Marshall Best at the University of Arizona. Yeah, I'm allowed to be friends with him. It's not an ASU rule. He has his own uh, population statistics that he's kept going for years, for decades, and he's generally been pretty, pretty accurate. So I, that's my favorite projection. That means we're going to have, in 2017, about 115,000 people net increase in population. And if we're not going to be short of houses, this blue line has got to get back to that red line. No sign whatsoever of the builders stepping up to that at the moment. They're all very nervous. They got beaten up like crazy. Had to lay off more than half of their employees. Everyone complained about them, and their stock went to the toilet. Now they are feeling better about their stock, as you probably noticed. Home building shares have, in some cases, gone up by fivefold in the last eight years or so. But they're not. They don't see it as their duty to build all the homes we need. They're not the government. They, they built the homes they could make a profit on, right? So if uh, Ponte in particular, in their most recent call, saying we're deliberately underbuilding because we'd like prices to go up. 
we're focusing on profit, not units. And so that says to me that it's going to take quite some time before we have enough competition in home building that everybody is diving in trying to build on because there's certainly demand. The problem at the moment, though, is that demand, as lots of people want to home, but they're disqualified. So the builders, currently, they're saying that traffic in their sales offices is really great, but the number of sales contracts being signed is nothing special. Because what we have is people who've been in the penalty box for a long time, having had a foreclosure or a short sale, and they say, oh, my three years is up now, I can go buy a house. But their credit score is still not that good, not so good. Or even if it's good, they've got something else that they have to document for their lender, which they can't document. There's lots and lots of, and if you've tried to get along recently, I know I have, you know, the number of hoops you have to jump through is just amazing. So we've got all of those people who would like to buy a house, but they're probably going to have to stay as tenants for quite a bit longer because they can't qualify for the loan or they can't get together the much larger down payment than they thought they were going to need. You know, some people say, well, I've got 5,000, but they find that they need 10,000 to be approved for the loan. So, this, however, suggests to me that we have a long-term housing shortage which isn't going to be solved. And it's not going to be solved by people deciding to sell the homes that they already live in, because these people are not going to move out of state in most cases. They're going to buy another house. So they might sell their house in Tempe and move to Jamba or something. That doesn't improve the supply. It only improves the supply if they sell up here and they move to California or somewhere else. And exactly the opposite is starting to happen now. We've got more Californians selling up there than moving here. We've got more businesses deciding to move from California to Arizona because our tax structure is even more attractive now than it once was. So that the, the sort of waves of uh, people moving is actually suggesting that the inventory problem is going to get worse before it gets better. So here's my outlook. Notice that there's no numbers on it. <laughs> I am a mathematician, but I don't like to use numbers until, unless I'm absolutely sure of them. But when you're out looking, all of it's guesswork. The low inventory will cause prices to rise. Investors are going to slow down because the prices are getting too high for them. Foreclosures are basically no longer very interesting. Short sales are not even very interesting now. I mean, clearly there's a number of people who are still way on the water, so if they want to move, they will have to short sell. But the number of short sale listings has dropped like a stone over the last year. People are more confident in the market, despite what pundits tell them about impending disaster. They just feel that the market's getting better, and that as the credit of all those people who went through terrible times starts to improve, they will become buyers again. So we've got a massive pool of potential buyers. So I perceive that buyers are going to outnumber sellers for a very long time until we go through the whole cycle and the builders start overbuilding again. They will do one day, it's just fun for me to be dead and gone by the time. Their ramping up of production is very slow at the moment. I'm constantly amazed by how low the permit counts are. It's always lower than I expected. But the luxury market is something special on its own. You've seen how that is improving in price, particularly for the 500 to 750 range, but also starting to improve quite a bit for the higher ranges too. No reason why that should stop. Unless the stock market collapses. That's the other thing to be aware of, because the whole housing market is not affected by the stock market, but the luxury market is. So if we have suddenly lose 25% in the stock market, you expect the luxury market to go pretty quiet then too. Okay, that's all my prepared material. Take questions now. Yes, Don? Um, so it looks like You see a lot of growth on the upside. Right. And um, you said that your seasonal, that there's going to be a dip on the seasonal pattern. But do you think because of the low inventory that that's going to fall suit in a uh, comparative numerical sense or not? 
Well, there, there tends to be a lull in the luxury market once the temperatures get above 100. Uh, people who are going to buy a luxury home like to be here in the spring or the winter. Once it gets to May, they tend to find somewhere else. <laughs> and they can afford to be somewhere else. They've probably got two or three houses, these people buying more than home. So the sales that are recorded in between June and September tend to be dominated by stuff the investors are buying or normal folks. And the averages, therefore, dip down. But it's really a mixed thing. It's not a really a change in the market. And you shouldn't take any notice of it, really. What I'm saying is that by the, if the market's going to go up, it will do it in October and November, not in July and August. We tend to go up a lot between February and June and then take a breather. And that's happened most years for the last 13 years that I've been measuring. So I would expect it to happen. It may not happen, nobody knows for sure, but if the chart moves down or sideways, I certainly wouldn't be surprised. Expensive luxury home. It's, it's amazing how little quality supply in there is. There is supply, well, but it's either old. I mean, Desert Mountain recently, first home in Scott Knock County was built 25 years ago. And they're right. building in the same pattern. There's could certainly, if you've got a buyer who has very specific requirements, and you know, they, a luxury buyer has often got very firm ideas of what they want, it's quite possible, even with 240 homes available, not one of them is suitable for that. Right. So that can be a problem. And certainly the, the sales rate for luxury homes is far higher in the first quarter of this year than it was at the same time last year. So the buyers are coming back in greater numbers and the supply is still there. So I could be proven wrong and the luxury market continues to, to move ahead. But the pressure isn't as strong as it is below 200,000, but we just got buyers at outnumbering sellers by two or three to one. Okay? Thanks. Uh, Michael, what do you see in terms of our new population growth? Blue collar versus white collar? That, I'm not really a specialist in that area. Um, I, I focus really on the housing numbers.